One, check, one, check. Aloha. Let's try that again. Aloha. Aloha. Very good. Thank you. My name is Matthew Schmidt. I'm going to be presenting today. I'm from the University of Hawaii. Invisibly here with me is my colleague, Paul McKimmy, who sadly couldn't make it. So I will be trying to cover his slides, but if I stumble, please forgive me. Um, if you would like a copy of this, I believe it under an open license, so you can feel free to grab it. And if you're wondering where you can get it, you can go to tinyurl.com, oer-dbr-aect2014, or you can just take a picture of the QR code and you'll have it. So it's in PowerPoint format. So feel free to grab it, and if you need it from me after, I can get that for you. This is me on the left, and this is Paul on the right. We both work at the University of Hawaii, which is located on Oahu. And um, our campus looks a little bit like this. Our students actually do hang outside and uh, study because the weather is always perfect. And if you're wondering about this, no, that's not where I live. That's in Pahoa on the Big Island. We have a, I'd like to say, wonderful football team. I'll just say we have a football team. <laughs> this is 15 minutes up the street from my house, and this guy likes to hang out there. We have a wonderful Second Life Island where we have a virtual graduation each year. Given the uniqueness of the Hawaiian Islands and that we have students on each and every one of the islands, we will have them join us virtually in Second Life so that they can all enjoy a, uh, a mutual graduation experience. And this is our College of Education, and right there is my office. So today, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background on the study, or what I should say, the concept of what I want to go over today. I'll talk to you a little bit about open educational resources, a little bit about design-based research, and then the crux of the talk, which is the symbiosis between the two, and I'll be providing some examples. Briefly, how many of you are involved with or are familiar with design-based research? Very good. So. This background, um, it goes back to, gosh, 2004 when I gave my very first round table at AECT. It's been 10 years. And um, I talked about open source software for higher education. And since then, as I come to AECT each year, I see an increasing interest in open resources for education from K through 12 and into higher ed. Um, in 2012, uh, my friend Jen gave a presentation on open educational or open source technologies, and we had a long conversation afterwards because there was some confusion about what this notion of open actually meant. Um, open in the sense of free versus open in the sense of freely redistributable, reusable, remixable, and so on. Uh, last year, I gave a workshop called Free Yourself uh, it, it's a very hoity-toity uh, title, Free Yourself from Software Hegemony. That and 50 cents will get you a cup of coffee. Uh, it was a great, um, I actually have one of my uh, workshop attendees here today, and you're using it up at Kent State, aren't you? These, so these resources are, uh, these open resources are being uh, reused. Uh, Rick was asking me about the design-based research at the, cro uh, the Crossroads Conference, which is where I got this idea by talking to Dave Wiley. And if you guys know anything about open educational resources, you know Dave is kind of the guru in that area. Um, I also wrote a paper last year about open source and design-based research symbiosis. And there is a lot of overlap between open source and open educational resources. So I thought I would give this talk today and again, this is mostly conceptual. So uh, this is the part that my colleague was going to give, so I'll try and get through it without stumbling too much. Open educational uh, resources as defined by UNESCO are technology-enabled open provision of educational resources for consultation, use, and adaptation by a community of users for non-commercial purposes. And this can be lecture material, references, readings, simulations, experiments, and so on. There's an additional uh, definition uh, by the Hewlett Foundation, and that's teaching, learning, and research resources, public domain, released under an intellectual property license, 
that permits their free use and repurposing by others. You can see there's a bit of a difference between these two definitions. I tend to lean more towards the Hewlett Foundations. And of course, this includes courses, course materials, modules, textbooks, all of this. And one thing that I didn't include on here, oh no, I did, I put it in, software. So open source software as well. So just a quick poll. How many of you have used OER, and we'll just go through, uh, have you, are you unsure of whether you've used OER? Okay, everyone's pretty sure they either have or have not. How many of you have never used OER? Okay. Um, how many of you have used OER to supplement your course materials? Okay, a number of you. To replace some of your course materials? Okay, replace all of your course materials. Okay, how many of you have modified OER? And how many of you developed OER? Okay, advocate for it? I guess I'm doing that today so I can raise my hand. Contracted for OER services, so hired other people to come do OER for you. Promoted OER policy, yeah. Department chair raises his hand. Very good. So let's talk about some open stuff. Let's talk about this notion of open. So we've got open educational resources, open access scholarship, open source software, open standards, open textbooks, open courses, open culture. I'm sure that many of these you've seen, you've heard, some of them may even resonate with you. Well, everyone seems to think that open is good, right? Open is great, we want everything to be good, but there's this issue with claiming that everything is open and that's that it dilutes the meaning of the term open. One example of this dilution would be with massively open online courses, many of which are neither massive, open, well, they are online and they are courses, right? So, um, Oftentimes when we talk about open, that is used synonymously with the word free. We're gonna get into the word free because that's also problematic. But we're going to use the term gratis for free, so there's no actual payment for it, right? That is what we mean uh, by free in this, in this uh, sense. So let's talk a little bit about that problem with open and freedom. And this is, this is one of those things that I consistently grapple with. It's a bit of a philosophical problem because, yeah, free is great, right? And if I get it for free, then why should I care? But ultimately, this, this distinction is quite important because gratis, paying nothing for it versus libre in the, ter in the, in the sense of liberty, right, is an important distinction to make when we're talking about the symbiosis with design-based research because the free doesn't really matter so much as the freedom when it comes to design-based research. So when we're talking about gratis, that's like you know, free beer. Free as in beer versus free as in freedom. So we've got our free beer and then we've got our freedom. Anyhow, um, when we talk about these free rights, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with the four R's of open educational resources. Open, in this sense, does refer to freedom. choose, and that's typically going to be designated by the Creative Commons license. Now, when we talk about open as an OER, we're talking about ours being able to reuse, recycle, remix, and reuse. So we maintain that free is not the same as freedom, and that free is actually less than freedom, but with OER, you can have your freedom and your free beer as well. That's my Photoshop skills there, guys. So our College of Education at the University of Hawaii uses OER extensively. Um, we have Linux-based computers in our college lab. Uh, we fully support LibreOffice, so every single computer that is issued has LibreOffice installed. Uh, we have an open stack cloud server infrastructure. Our uh, website is Drupal. We use cloud for secure storage. Open Sim virtual learning environments. Uh, we use Sakai for our campus wide course management. And in the uh, learning design and technology department, we have a textbook cer zero certificate in online learning and teaching. And we have also drafted a department wide OER statement that we just recently ratified, which I'm not going to read it out loud to you. But as you can see, we support. 
So let's talk a little bit about design-based research. So design-based research, I guess there's maybe some debate about this, but I'll go with the uh, party line that design-based research emerged from the learning sciences. And if we're to define learning sciences, I'm going to take a look at this definition, and that's to advance scientific, our scientific understanding of learning and to design and assess learning uh, innovations. And that's, of course, tempered by Janet Kolodner's strong belief that creative use of technology can provide some, but not all, of the answer. So the focus of the learning sciences is on cognition, society, and culture, and then wrapping those up in learning environments. But how do we build those learning environments? And traditionally, what we do is we're going to take real world situations. Uh, here's some real world situations. These are some kids at a hacker space. Uh, these are some people building a house for UNESCO. And uh, this is a picture I took diving in Hawaii. And then we're going to take um, some sort of a theory, theoretical foundations of learning environment. We're going to take design principles. And we're going to put those together. And by taking theory, design principles, and real world situations, what we're able to do is we're able to engineer learning environments that embody the theories that uh, we believe are going to be useful for learning. The way that we are able to both develop, design, develop, and evaluate these engineered learning environments is through design-based research. And I have to thank uh, Tom Reeves and Susan Kenny for allowing me to use their graphic. Um, and this is pretty much the traditional graphic for how design-based research works now. Traditionally, three phases where you start out with an analysis and exploration phase, which is iterative. That moves into a design and construction phase, also iterative, and then into an evaluation and reflection phase, which is iterative. This would be one macro cycle of design-based research. Within those macro cycles, you'll have lots and lots of uh, micro cycles. So within analysis and exploration, you may do a number of micro cycles. Same here, same here. You may even go back and do some meso cycles, so some mid-range cycles. And the outcomes are you have a, an intervention that's going to be maturing, but at the same time, you're going to have theoretical understanding that is also improving. And the notion is that by going through these cycles over time, your implementation and spread is going to grow. So your scale is going to increase. So let's take open educational resources and design-based research and think about symbiosis. So let's think about how design-based research complements open educational resources. First of all, uh, design-based research is systematic and iterative. Uh, it's going to be based in real life situations. It encourages collaborations, and it provides opportunities to monitor progress against goals. All of these things can be used to forward open educational resources, to integrate open educational resources, to work within a community to build open educational resources. From what I was able to find in the literature, and there's not a whole lot out there, how people have used design-based research and open educational resources together. One of the ways that it's done is to use existing OER to complement a design-based research, uh, let's say, trajectory or project. So let's say this is our design-based research project. What then happens is someone finds an open educational resource, and they use that then to complement the existing project. So they incorporate it in. Another way is to use design-based research to adapt existing OER. So the project is using design-based research as a process model in order to adapt a number of existing open educational resources. So we might start out with OER1, OER2, and OER3, which are very disparate and don't look the way that we want them to for our project. We move through one iteration of design-based research, and following that, they look a little bit different, but they still don't look the way we want. So we take them through another process until we're able to iterate them into the uh, shape that we want them to be, the color that we want them to be. So yes, obviously, we're not talking about shapes and colors, but we're talking about theories and interventions here. Are you guys following me? OK. I belabored the, the graphics on this. OK, 
The third is to use design-based research to design and implement new open educational resources. And it sounded like that's kind of what you guys are doing. So this is no different from any other kind of design-based research. The only thing that's different is that your maturing intervention is going to be released under some sort of an open license, and your theoretical understanding is going to be uh, published under some sort of an open access license, right? So in terms of the uh, symbiosis here, you may not be seeing it yet, but you will in a minute. So here's, here's our symbiosis. What you get with this is you allow other people the four R's. So other people can now revise, remix, reuse, and redistribute. And if, depending on the license that you choose, sometimes they have to give those changes back to you so that you can then the community building off of what you've done. And this has happened with a number of open educational resource repositories, such as Merlot, which has been spun a couple of different times. Um, I talked a little bit about those community benefits, but in terms of social validity, and I think that's really one of the main factors here, uh, by being able to contribute what you are doing in terms of theory and intervention freely, and by free I mean free as in beer and free as in freedom, this is a societal contribution, right? That matters if you're using grant money. That's my personal opinion. But if you're using federal grant money that's paid for by tax dollars, I do strongly believe that that should be released to the public domain, and it should be freely redistributable in the four R's. Okay, so let's, let's try and put this into context. This might be a little bit heady so far. So we're going to design a technology intervention. It's an ed tech class. So we start with this concept of what we want to do with our ed tech class. And we get ourselves a textbook. It doesn't fit exactly, but that's the textbook everyone uses. So we're going to go with that textbook. And we've got some training that we found online that we are, let's say, our university has a license for, so we go with the, we, we go with the free training. Okay, well, then we've got this software tool. Well, that's part of what this ed tech class is all about. We have to use this tool. So we're going to try and fit that in. And then we've got our own materials, and we know those are going to fit because we built those ourselves, right? So what does this look like to you? Looks like it's time for another iteration because it's design-based research, right? So we're going to go into iteration two where we start with our ed tech class and that proprietary textbook that we found just it wasn't a really good fit. So let's, let's try a couple more. So, well, they, they still don't fit so well, but maybe we're not getting at everything, but what's that going to do for your students? And it's going to raise your students' costs. And then, well, that proprietary training didn't work when we were using it, so we kind of tweaked it, and we, we, made, we, we made some changes, and it, it sort of fits. But now we're locked into using that training, aren't we? And we're locked into using that training because that training is tied to this software tool. That software tool didn't fit exactly before, but we've done some tweaks to get it to fit a little bit better, but now we're locked into using that software tool as well. And what, ju what just happened to our freedom? What just happened into our freedom as in the eagle? We've, we've locked ourselves in to a solution, and it's going to be tough to get out of that solution. Need more, more beer. That's exactly what you're yeah, you might. You very well might. <laughs> but your materials are still awesome, right? OK. Let's go into iteration three. Well, we already know we're stuck with our training and we're stuck with our software. Maybe there's something else we can do. A course reader, there we go. So what happens now? Well, we've got money to license that, but now we also have a time component. How many of you have ever tried to put together a course reader? I did it once. Then I switched to open educational resources. So let's take, a, let's take a moment and think about what happens when we have these monetary restrictions, vendor lock-in, and trying to fit a square peg in a round hole, right? How is that going to affect 
ultimately our implementation and spread, and how does that affect the, the degree to which our intervention is maturing, and what do we really learn theoretically about what we were doing, okay? Now let's flip that on its head. Let's take our ed tech class and go with open educational resources. Okay, so we've got an OER textbook that we decide to reuse. So that's one of the four R's we're going with. We find some training materials online. We decide to reuse those. But instead of a tool, notice what we're doing. There's some kind of distinction here. We're not going with a single software tool. We're going with an open standard. So let's say before we were using Photoshop to create graphics. Well, creating graphics, that's something that's fairly generic. You don't have to have Photoshop for that. Sure, it works, but you can use something like GIMP, and there are other options that exist out there. By going with an open standard, you just opened up your options, and you've got a much better fit, openness. Okay, we go into iteration two. Okay, so we've got our open standard in our materials. Those are fitting pretty well. Um, we're using a proprietary and an open source software tool, great. We also have now changed our training materials. We took the materials that we had before, we revised them, we found other things and reused them, and we remixed them all into our very own training materials by basically um, benefiting from the four R's, and that's my graphical representation of the four R's, and the same thing happens with the textbook, right? We're able to take all the pieces from other textbooks, write some pieces of the textbook ourselves remix it all into our own textbook for our class. Are we seeing a better fit here? Okay, what happens in iteration three? We release those materials. We release our class. We find that there's symbiosis happening between the materials and our textbook because people are using this, making changes, giving those back to us. We're building that into our textbook. People are using our textbook. We're building those changes into our course, and so on and so forth throughout this entire ecosystem. And look at what that openness has done. And think about how that, in turn, impacts our design-based research process, right? So that's my example. So what happens next? For our learning design and technology department, one thing is we are working on redesigning our master's program using a design-based research process. And as such, we're considering incorporating open educational resources where it makes sense as per our department policy. We also recognize that in some cases, there just aren't OERs. And if you've ever tried to find OERs for methods courses, good luck. So uh, if you're trying to find qualitative and quantitative OER textbooks, there aren't very many. So um, other things that we're thinking about doing, uh, designing, developing, contributing OERs to the community and establishing an OER repository. Um, as a department, revisiting the tenure guidelines uh, to recognize OER contributions and not only journals, books, and so on, right? And uh, then finally, one of the things, and this is a challenge I think for OER in general, is some sort of a peer review process for open educational resources to ensure the quality of those materials. And with that said, I would like to say thank you very much, or mahalo. If you'd like to find the resources, they're on this, and if you want to grab a copy of this, you can have it. What's that? I can. Give me a minute. Got a, got a lot of these. Great question, though. Very good. Other questions? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a, a, a online learning and teaching certificate. Um, where students can take five courses and earn a certificate in online teaching. And by textbook zero, what we mean is that uh, we, students don't have to pay for any of their textbooks. Uh, so we either use open educational resources or we use resources that are freely available on the web for all of the texts. 
the term is textbook zero. If you're interested in textbooks here, you might want to check out what they're doing at Tidewater Community College, where the entire community college has gone textbook zero. Tidewater Community College? Other questions? That's a tough one, and that's not something that really, I don't think you can solve that. Because um, in that case, you're really trying to change people's beliefs, and we know that changing beliefs, it takes a long time. We'll just put it like that. And well, how do you do that? I don't think there's an answer to that. That's a, that's a tough one. Open's great, but that doesn't mean open is easy. Great. Well, I won't hold you guys hostage. Thanks for uh, watching my presentation. I appreciate it. Enjoy the conference.